10. Nothing but some fog and sprinkles today, but tomorrow could be a different story depending on where you live. Good evening and thanks for joining us. So you're prepared for it. Let's go right away to Hutch Johnson. He joins us right away with details. Hutch, we were talking just before we went on the air. You've spotted some things happening out in the garrison, the White Shield area? Yeah, indeed. In fact, taking a look at the North Dakota Department of Transportation cameras out there, we see some suspicious looking stuff on the ground out there. And this is accumulating again on the grassy areas. And they've had snow on again and off again in that area throughout the day. We continue to battle our problems with the fog. There's plentiful low level moisture in the atmosphere, and the temperature is cooling off, especially in our westernmost counties where we have upper 30s. And it's only going to take mid 30s to upper 30s to cause snow falling from the clouds tonight. Now, the storm system is actually to our south as we slide down into South Dakota. Look at the thunder and lightning. We will hear lightning, thunder, snow, you name it. When we rise and shine, we'll have some areas of white traveling conditions. I'll have hour by hour details on exactly the path of the storm. The latest model is in. It does look like we could see some places with up to three inches on those grassy areas by mid-morning tomorrow. More in a few moments. You knew it was coming. It is. All right, thanks, mm -hmm. Hutch. Tonight, we continue to investigate the refugee resettlement program locally. An opinion held by Medi is that crime is increasing because of new people, refugees included. One of the questions on a recently commissioned Valley News Live survey is, do you think the police need to provide statistics on crimes committed by refugees? And an overwhelming number of you replied, that they should. Now, do the police have that information now? And what do refugees living here for years have to say about all of this? Well, Valley News Team's immigration and relocation reporter Bradford Eric answers these questions. 82% of you say police departments and resettlement agencies should be required to provide stats related to refugees. Fargo police say it's hard to do. We don't monitor, okay. monitor at all criminal statistics based on your immigration or even your cultural status. It would be overwhelmingly complicated and almost impossible to do. We can't even monitor growth off of census information. Christy Jacobson is the cultural liaison officer for Fargo PD. A veteran who served tours in Germany and Iraq, Jacobson's position was specifically created due to the diverse population now calling Fargo home. For example, um, our former Bosnian refugees would be white on a racial um, demographic. Our, Iraqis, Afghanis would also be considered white. Officer Jacobson says it's her responsibility to educate refugees about what is acceptable in the eyes of the law. And then also by studying and interacting with those communities, not only am I educating them, they're educating me, and I take that information back to my fellow law enforcement officers and agencies. As her title suggests, Jacobson serves as the go-between for the refugee communities and the Fargo police. Pretty um, pretty equal to language barrier is the trust issue. She says in many of the countries people come from, the police are corrupt and people fear them. So it's her job to gain the trust and support of those leaders in the refugee community. But what about those people who say you can't take someone from a war-torn part of the world? And plop them down in Fargo, North Dakota, give them a couple classes and expect them to be a, a stand-up model citizen. I disagree. We provide um, or do our best to provide wraparound services for these individuals. But of course, trauma is going to take time to resettle. But we do the same every day with our troops that have endured extensive amount of trauma. So what do refugees think about our survey? And can they confirm the feelings and opinions that survey shows exist in our community? I came to the United States in 2003. Okay. Uh, so um, for a while I've been moving around, but I lived here for... I can, I can give you probably like... Uh, a good five, six years. Pastor Medende is originally from Kigali, Rwanda, a country in Africa. Medende says it was the opportunities the United States offered that drew his family here. So to be able to, to go to school and, you know, and kind of learn from the best. And Medende eventually went to school, went to college, and is now an artist living in the area. I shared the survey results with him, showing 57% of people living here do not want refugees. I guess uh, it's, it's, it's a very difficult sentiment to think about. Uh, um, it's also, I guess it's happening all over the place, I guess, uh, not just in Fargo. Medende says it's maybe something to do with people's preconceived notions, or that people feel the government is not spending their money in the right way. But his reaction? A little bit, a little bit sad, a little bit sad, uh, because, uh, uh, because most, most refugees really, uh, it's, it's not their first choice to say, 
Oh, I'm getting up, I'm going to America, you know? Fargoans and Morherians need to know uh, we are part of this community, over 10% of this community, and we are doing most of the work that nobody else is doing. Fauzia Adi is executive director at the Immigrant Development Center in Moorhead. It's a small grassroots operation helping refugees and immigrants understand the economic requirements of starting a business here in the U.S. Adi fled her home in Somalia to a refugee camp in Kenya. I didn't have a choice. I, I was in a refugee camp and, um, and uh, they divided our refugee camp in so many different um, pockets. So uh, countries who can afford to take refugees can take them. That was 18 years ago. Now Fauzia has a family, has been the only delegate from North Dakota at a White House event and an astoundingly positive attitude. But what did she think about the survey? I know it's hard to realize because uh, it's hard to know how fortunate you are. And uh, it's hard to explain unless they go through trainings or, or kind of uh, if you take your staff and go to camping for five days, you will realize how good it was home and the shower you had and everything. So it's hard and I don't blame them. I don't blame them. I don't blame the, um, the Fargo Moorhead community realizing exactly what we went through. Christy Jacobson, Pastor Medende, and Fauzia Adi all say more education and just being more neighborly couldn't hurt. Bradford Eric, Valley News Live. Tomorrow, join us on Valley News Live 10 at 10 as Bradford sits down with the CEO of Lutheran Social Services, Jessica Thomason, to take a hard look at the work LSS does to help bring refugees to the valley and integrate them into society. What started as a whistleblower complaint has become a political dogfight between two of the top cops in Stutzman County. The original whistleblower complaint went like this. Someone named Dominic said the Stutzman County Sheriff's Office was using government property for recreational use. Their proof? A picture of a jet ski supposedly owned by the county and being ridden by a deputy and the sheriff's son. After requesting a list of property owned by the sheriff's department, we discovered that they, in fact, never bought a jet ski under their name. Sheriff Chad Kaiser is out of town on training, and upon hearing the claim, he was at a loss. I don't know where or why this would come about, um, especially going to you know the news media. Um, like I said, I'm pretty blindsided by this. Although we don't know who the source is, we discovered that the profile attached to the packet sent was an alias from a detective at the Jamestown Police Department, Tom Nagel, who also happens to be the president of the Fraternal Order of Police. Now, he says he didn't send us the packet. We have confirmed with the North Dakota Game and Fish Department that the jet ski is owned by Kaiser's brother-in-law, Ryan Hofstall. Cars are being broken into in West Fargo, and the thieves have taken several shotguns and rifles. Police are warning us to keep your guns locked up and out of your cars overnight. Valley News Team's Macy Anger spoke with a hunter who found out the hard way. But they went through everything. Jared Hoffer spent all day getting the driver's side window repaired on his truck. I don't know if he took the rock and smashed the window and just threw it through the truck after. Earlier this week, he came out to find this rock on the passenger seat and the window shattered across the driveway. I had a bunch of hunting clothes and everything else in the back that has glass all over it. The rifle was in the back, the shotgun was in the front. Hoffer says he planned to take off early that morning and had packed his hunting gear so he wouldn't forget anything this weekend. Normally would not do that and just thought five to six hours is not that much time. This is just that time of year where, you know, everyone's getting excited, but unfortunately so are the, the criminals. West Fargo police say Hoffer isn't the only victim in the Eagle Run neighborhood. There's been at least three other vehicle break-ins and just as many guns stolen. Well, for law enforcement, just the fact that firearms are out there is, is kind of scary for us and for the public. I love my kids very much and, and they're outside playing all the time. So any kind of bad stuff going on makes me very nervous. Police say hunting stickers or packed cars can make you a target. It's a lesson to me to be more responsible with my, my own property. Well, it's a costly fix. He's glad it wasn't worse. It's just material and it's, it's um, outside the home. It, they didn't enter the home. So that helps a little bit too. In West Fargo, Macy Inger, Valley News Live.
Investigators say they have several leads on the break-ins. They hope to find the people involved or release descriptions by the end of this week. U.S. officials say there's evidence that indicates it was likely a bomb possibly planted by ISIS operatives that brought down a Russian airliner in Egypt last weekend, killing more than 200 people. And investigators are looking at the possibility that an explosive device may have been planted on the plane by ground crews, baggage handlers, or others at the airport before the airliner even took off. But experts say it could also have been a mechanical failure that blew up a fuel tank. ISIS, now under attack by the Russian military in Syria, did claim that it did bring down the plane.